Thank you for joining us here on the Frank Sontag Podcast. We drop every Friday on all the usual social media outlets, mostly on YouTube. And I am grateful to have this in-studio guest, a dear friend of mine, who many of you probably know. He's been the senior pastor at Godspeak for almost 17 years, maybe even more than that. Pastor Rob McCoy is here. 23? Yeah. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah, yeah. Boy, those six years just kind of come and go really quickly. It's flying by. Rob, it's good to see you. You too, Frank. I, I, you're in the book of who's who. I'm in the book of who's he. <laughs> and hearing your introduction, it, that voice it, it radiating throughout all the L.A. Basin, it's, yeah. it's still butter, bro. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we were talking a bit about bios off air. I went online last night and you're kind of like me. You're like, eh, bios, whatever. But I do want to say a little bit about your past and we'll see what the what, Lord's got. What part of my past? <laughs> the good part of your past. <laughs> the other part I don't know much about, but we could probably share those later on. Whatever you want. So in your early days, I know you were raised in a very interesting household. Many times from the pulpit, you've preached about your dad. Yeah, good man. And your mom. Yeah, good lady. Talk about your childhood a little bit. Well, I uh, I'm a minister, so I wasn't I, I wasn't raised in a Christian home per se. I don't remember uh, going to church. I don't remember ever reading the Bible. We we had a memorized prayer that a couple of times we did at the dinner table, but I was the youngest of four, and there was a separation between me and the next sibling by six years. So. My older siblings are a planet, and I'm a moon that revolves around them. And I had a different upbringing. So by the time I was, you know, of an impressionable age, we we had no presence of Christianity in our home. But my parents were very active civically. My dad had run for city council twice. He was president of the Rotary, president of the Chamber of Commerce. My mother was president of the Republican Women in, in the Coronado, where I was born and raised. Back when we lived there, it was a sleepy little Navy town. Now it's a billionaire's boys club. It's, yeah. And... Um, they were good people, and and uh, you know they, there was always an empty seat at our our dinner table for folks that drop in. They were always caring for folks. Um, when Vietnam fell, my my parents adopted a, a Vietnamese couple that became you know in a sense a family, and took care of them for three years until they got a footing and then started their family. Um, they were very sacrificial in that respect. Good people, and um, I. I, it was an idyllic childhood. I learned a lot from my dad, and I learned a lot from my mom. I'm very grateful for him. And in the end of their life, they they both became Christians, um, which you know you didn't. I didn't think it, there would be a tremendous amount of change uh, because I already considered them, you know, very moral. But there was. It was profound. Um, a, a tenderness appeared with both of them that was beyond even where they were previously. So I, I love them both. Can't say enough good things about them. Mm. You were raised next to the the body of water called the Coronado, as you mentioned. Yeah. Talk about your affinity with water. I know you were an All-American, swimming, water polo, et cetera, but what about water? I love it. I, I, I love moving water. I'm not a lake fan. I, I like salt water, open ocean. I uh, was born and raised, as I said, in Coronado. So I, I lifeguarded at the beach. Um, I, I did. I swam and played water polo. I, I trained under a man named Michael Troy, who was a... Uh, two-time gold medal winner, uh, broke his own world record eight times. He was a Navy SEAL with two tours of Vietnam. Um, he'd been a SEAL team instructor, still renowned uh, in the training facility there at the Coronado Amphibious Base. He passed away a couple years ago, but uh, bigger than life, uh, hardest hardest coach I've I've ever trained under. And I got a scholarship and went to Fresno State and swam and played water polo there. Also at Tulane University in San Diego Mesa. I was I was on the six year, no five year plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, these days um, with everything in in like college basketball, some of these guys are on the eight year plan. Guy goes to the line and looks like he's twenty five years old and he's a junior yeah, at such yeah. and such university. Yeah, well, it, I, I I went to Tulane on a scholarship, hated it, left, came back to San Diego. Um, then you you have five years to complete four years of eligibility with the NC two A at least back then. Yep. So I, I sat out a year and then had a season with San Diego Mesa and then got another scholarship to Fresno State, and that's where I ended up graduating. Um, but I love the ocean. I can't get enough of it. Uh, Michelle and I want to end up there later in life. Um, we both met in Coronado. It's a real magical place for us. So, yeah, love the ocean. Talking about your coach, I just had a mentor of mine. 
He's now 85 years young. He's the only other coach at UCLA who has a national championship basketball. His name's Jim Herrick. And we sat here for an hour and a half, and he was just sharing pearls of wisdom and woodenisms. He's a wooden disciple. And we talked about the importance of coaching. And he said many things in the interview, but one that stood out, and maybe you can talk a little bit more about your coach and maybe a life lesson he taught you. Coach said, it's amazing when you praise young men Mm. versus speak down to them. You speak down to them, their head will drop. Praise, heads up. He goes, discipline, yes but always praise people. He always kind of takes the high road. Was your coach hard on you when you were swimming? Yeah, very. Um, But I I like what what you just described. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver. And and when Jesus said, thou shall not commit murder, but I say to you, anyone who says to his brother Raka or fool is in danger of the fires of hell. And what he's saying is you don't need a gun to kill somebody. Your words will do just fine. But conversely, words can also bring life and encouragement. But you want to speak the truth in love. And and part of honest words is to tell folks, you're not as good as you think you are. Mm. Which brings me to a story that you asked me to recount of my time with Coach Mike Troy. Um, <laughs> well, there's, there's two things. One is my son was getting his Eagle Scout Award, and I asked Mike if he wanted to come to the Eagle Scout court of honor. I didn't think he'd come, but you know, you send out invitations to big people. Well, lo and behold, Mike came and he, he, that was a Saturday night. He stayed for Sunday services. Now he's, he's Catholic. I'm a Protestant minister. He's kind of a social Catholic, kind of grew up that way. Um, and his wife, Nancy, uh, was a Protestant believer and she was thrilled to go to church and Mike was there. And I made the mistake of giving him the microphone, thinking that he'd say something nice about me to the congregation. And he says, you know, Rob wasn't my most talented swimmer. Oh, boy. And I'm like, come on, dude. I was an All-American. I still hold the records at San Diego Mesa, Fresno State. I made the senior nationals. You know, come on. I made the Olympic trials. And, and he said, "He said, but what he lacked in talent, he made up for in tenacity. And I was all right. I guess that's okay. Well, when he passed, uh, my brother and I went out to Phoenix uh, for his funeral. And, you know, you had gold medal winners and, and national champions that were all in the lineup to speak. Nancy saw me. She said, Pastor Rob, would you speak? I said, no, Nancy, get, you, got, you got the lineup. Because swimming-wise, I didn't, I didn't qualify to stand behind the dais. And each person that spoke, and it was an epiphany for everyone in the room, Every person that spoke said, you know, Mike said I wasn't his most talented swimmer, <laughs> but what I lacked in ability, I made up for in tenacity. Oh my goodness. And, and it, it took me back to the most memorable experience I've ever had with that man. It was a morning practice um, and, and I'd had perfect attendance and there was only four of us on the entire team that had maintained perfect attendance. It was an outdoor pool. It was the winter time. Sometimes a heater would be broken. He was relentless. He'd make you get in no matter what. And it was rough, and there was five of us that morning, and uh, he he gives a set of eight 200-yard butterflies, and the interval was five seconds slower than my fastest 200-yard butterfly time. So if I went my fastest time, I'd get five seconds rest to begin the next one. It's an impossible task. And um, I, I, I did one, and I made it under the interval. And then I failed on the second one. And I was thinking, well, he's going to realize this is a bad interval. He goes, get some rest. You're going to do it again. And, and you, you go through all the iterations of grieving, like, you know, pleading and begging. And then, you know, and, and then finally, you just get to a place where I, if I don't get this done, I'm never leaving here. I can either quit or finish this. And, and I'm thinking, my dad's going to come because I got to get to school. He'll save me. And my dad shows up and, and Mike... Troy was a commander in the U.S. Navy when he got out. My dad was a Navy captain. And as my dad's approaching to pick me up to take me to school, Mike says, "Uh, Captain McCoy, uh, Rob's going to be staying a little longer. Um, We'll make sure he gets home. And and I'm like, Dad, this is abuse. Get me out of here, you know. (laughs) And and, and my dad looks at me and says, okay, Mike. Mm -hmm. I mean, try doing that today. You'd be in jail. But my dad knew. And he, he heads out and goes to work. And I was there till probably 1130 in the morning. 
and I finally got the last one finished. I, I couldn't move my arms. I mean, I had gone through, you know, I was exhausted. I probably, to do eight of them, I probably did over 20. And I get out, and he looks at me, and he says, Rob, you learned two things today. You're not as weak as you think you are, mm. and you're not as tired as you think you are. I'll see you tonight. And I was thinking, well, he'd relax on us in the evening. He didn't relax in the evening, but I made it through. And, and that has taken me, we, we all learned that day at the memorial service. Mike wasn't teaching us to be good swimmers. He was preparing us to be tenacious in life. Mm. That, that it, there's going to be obstacles. Go over them, go under them, go around them, or go through them, but get past it. And I I've cherish that. Mm. Rob McCoy is my guest. You, as you were sharing, and you alluded to it, then and now, things are so different. I have a 16-year-old son. He's on the track team, and he's constantly, uh, not constantly, he, he complains a little bit like all the other sophomores. This is just, and I'm like, I try not to go back to when I ran high school track, we did this kind of stuff. We walked to school <laughs> uphill both ways. It was snowing here in California, believe it or not. But there is something to be said about the culture change and, and the softness or my heart grieves among the young men that when it comes to adversity, it seems as if we've lost something with them. Maybe we step down and, and we're asleep on our watch, but somehow they don't understand you can push through and be stronger for it versus, hey, just, you know, give me a, a trophy and, and, and I want to celebrate. Yeah, I've, I've heard one of the best definitions of a coach is someone who pushes you to do things you don't want to do so you can become the kind of person you've always wanted to be. Mm. And, you know, when, when you talk about, as a minister, I talk about the, the moral law that, it, and it's been said that the, the law is the, the wise restraints that make men free. And you think, well, how do, how do restraints make you free? You're applying restraints towards those things that easily beset you, the stuff that's easy. It, it, it it doesn't require work to watch television. It doesn't require work to, to to eat junk food and and do nothing. It doesn't. It, that comes naturally to us. It's easy to do, but to apply restraints towards those things that easily beset you in order to pursue excellence, that's the idea that coaches put forward. You're 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 going to challenge yourself in order to obtain a higher level of excellence. And that's what's so spectacular about sports is that you, you treat your opponent and, and your teammate as though they're both, both Christ. But, but the idea, if you're my opponent and we're competing against each other, I'm going to look at you and I'm going to say, this is going to be the best day you've ever had if you've come to win because I'm going to beat you, but you're going to have the best time you've ever accomplished. But, but I'm, I'm going to push you. You're not going to get past me. And, and the other person's saying the same thing. And there's that, that hearty competition to push each other to the highest level of excellence. That's, just, that's the spirit of competition. But, you know, people don't like to suffer. But the reality is, like the SEAL teams say, pain is only weakness leaving your body. Mm -hmm. you, you push yourself and you start to realize you're not as weak as you think you are. You're not as tired as you think you are because there's going to be days especially as, as you get older, because growing old isn't for, for wussies. You, 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 you lift yourself up and you go about your day. I'm, I'm busier at almost 60 than I was when I was 30. I've got more demands, more pressures. And it's one of those things where it's like, ah, let's do this. Is that all you got? Come on, bring it on. Amen. You remind me of a short story that I'll share. And then there's another area I want to transition into. So in my previous radio incarnation, I was on in San Diego on K Praise mm. in the afternoons. I get a call one afternoon from a guy who it seemed like he was very elderly. Mm. His voice, uh, th there was a tremor in his voice. He identified himself as Stu. And he got on and he just said some accolades. I don't need to go into all the nice stuff he said, but he was talking about how I've got guts and blah, blah, blah. And, and I just, as I was listening to him, I was praying and the Lord kind of said, ask him about if he's served. Hmm. So, hey, Stu, did, did, did you serve in the military? There's this pause. Stu goes into the story about the boat he was on at Pearl Harbor. His name was Stuart Headley. When he called my program, he was in his 90s. 
He made it to 99. He was one of the last Pearl Harbor survivors. I think we just lost the last one last week. No, no, there's still some living. Are there? Yeah. So Stu just emanated this, 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 this calm strength about him. And he talked about the importance of, first of all, loving the Lord, mm. loving your family. Yeah. But he talked about adversity and how his life, he has seen so many things. He's grateful for the, for the morning. He was still driving, still you know, being self-sufficient other than the family coming over. And I was just struck by life and, and how we look to elders. And we, I, my view, we've kind of lost something about reverence and, and age and, and wisdom versus this obsession with culture about staying young and all that other stuff. Yeah. So I'm not sure I'm going anywhere in particular other than I was blessed to get to know Stu and um, learned so much from him in the few years that him and I talked on the radio. The Bible says gray hair is, is wisdom for the ages. And, you know, I, that you invoked Pearl Harbor survivor. Um, my first name, Robert, was given to me. Uh, it's my, my godfather's name. My godfather is Rear Admiral Robert Broussard Early. And my godmother is his wife, Lois Early. They're both childless, and I was their godson. Now, they've both since passed. But I was running for the California State Assembly. I was um, in the primary and my own party that I had been a member of my entire life was carpet bombing me and coming after me in the primary and spent a million dollars against me. And, uh, you know, we're it's visceral, you know, males, mailers and everything. And I'm, I'm out of money and I'm getting carpet bombed by my own party. And I feel like I've led the folks that are behind this campaign on a rosy road to nowhere. And it's just overwhelming. We've gotten death threats, all kinds of stuff. And I'm going to miss my godfather's 100th birthday. He was 99 years young in 2014. <clears throat> and uh, and I, was, I figured, I'm just going to break away because I'm out of money. I can't respond to the ads. I don't even want to go to my mailbox anymore. I'm going to go down and visit him. I'll miss his birthday, but I'm going to go down and visit him. And my mother had passed. She died in 2010. My dad was in a home with Alzheimer's. So for all intents and purposes, my godfather was the patriarch of the family. Mm -hmm. And at 99 years young, uh, he, was, he was the highest ranking survivor of the attack on Pearl Harbor. He was lieutenant on the USS Casson on December 7th, 1941. And he, at 99, like your friend Stu, he was still driving. Not, not well, but he was still driving. And he would do, he would do 100 sit-ups a day in increments because he said movement was life. So I come down to visit him in the home he'd lived in all 50 years of my life. And as I come in, he had a booming voice. He said, how's it going? And I said, uh, Uncle Bob, I feel like I've led these folks on a rosy road to nowhere. I'm getting carpet bombed by my own party. California's going to hell in a handbag. And I'm just lamenting and whining. And he puts his hand up. Now, I'd never known him angry in all 50 years that, that he'd been a part of my life. He puts his hand up in the middle of my lamenting. And it's shaking with age. But he looks at me. He says, stop it. And it paralyzed me. It's, there's nothing like being spanked by a 99-year-old man. Mm. He says, stop it. He says, you don't know tough. I was 16 years old in the Great Depression. We didn't know where our next meal was going to come from. And had it not been an appointment to the Naval Academy, I would have never been able to obtain a college degree. And you, Rob, being a history major from Fresno State, you don't realize it, but we had the 22nd largest military on the face of the earth because we were in isolationist mode. And on that, that day, December 7, 1941, they sank my ship. The harbor was on fire and my shipmates were dead in the water and I was pulling them out. He says, the next day we took on a two-fronted war against two fascist nations. We brought them both to their knees, and we lifted that fleet from the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, refitted it, and floated into Tokyo Harbor to accept the, the surrender of the Japanese. We came back, cut federal spending by over 50%, and started the greatest industrial revolution in our lifetime. Now quit your whining and go finish what you started. I, I, I just was stunned. I mean, that's that generation. You don't know tough. Roll up your sleeves and get back to work. Mm. Amen. And, and he died at 100. He fell asleep in his chair. Got every ounce of living out of that 100-year-old body. Oh, that's such a wonderful story. Powerful. Rob McCoy is my guest, I'm grateful to say. You alluded to the area I wanted to get into. Uh, you studied history. And I want to do a little caveat here. Um, I, I, I'm... Uh, 
I don't want to do a little platitude here, but I'm grieved by, seems as if when it comes to history, we're living at a time, there's a lot of revisionism going on and, and let's do the cancel thing. And first of all, why did you study history and talk about the importance of everyone having a modicum of interest and intelligence and awareness in the area of history? Sure. Well, I don't know if you're going to like my, my answers. It's how I became a history major. I was, I was a student athlete, and I wasn't a good student. I hadn't read a book cover to cover my entire high school career. Never did, even done a term paper. Now, people say you can't get out of high school without a term paper. And I've admitted this. I, I've acknowledged it. I had someone else do the term paper for me. I was an athlete. I got through high school. I got a scholarship. Didn't do well at Tulane. Didn't flunk out, but didn't do well. When I got a second scholarship and got my AA degree at San Diego Mesa, and I'm, I'm now in my second scholarship having to declare a major, my dad's telling me to go into business and all this other stuff. I'm looking in the course catalog. I'm looking under business majors. I don't understand the titles of the classes, let alone what, <laughs> what they contain. It's, it's baffling to me. Yeah. And I'd just become a Christian, and I was devouring my Bible, which was the only book I'd ever read cover to cover. And I couldn't get enough of it. And I was reading and reading and reading. And it was it's the only book in the world. We don't read it. It reads us. It was jumping off the pages right into my heart and mind. And maybe dyslexia, I don't know what it is. But everywhere in the Bible where his, meaning God's, it, that word exists, it's the, the, the H is capitalized, H-I-S. So I get to Bachelor of Art in History. And every class begins with history of. Well, in my mind, it says his story of. And, and as I started to read, you know, some people think that history is cyclical. Some people think it's just abstract. But, but as Christians, we see history as, as the scarlet thread of redemption, God moving in the affairs of men for the sake of moving people to a place where, the, 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 as it says in Galatians 3, the law is a schoolteacher guardian to point us to Christ until faith comes. So this moral law and a contention with absolute truth and, and this idea of contending for it. You, you see these characters in history, and history to me is linear. So it was easy for me to memorize because it's a story. And, and being Scotch-Irish, we tell stories. And, and that's one of the things I love about the way Jesus teaches, parables, parabolos, it, 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 two parallel lines. He takes a heavenly truth, puts it next to an earthly illustration, and people can grasp it. And that's the power of stories. You, you can put forward an, a, a, an understanding. So when you remind people of their past, it inspires them for their future. But what we're seeing with the secular progressive world is they don't, they don't seek truth in history. They want to rewrite it to separate our children's history from our history. And, and, and the, the, the amazing thing about history, and this is, this is the, the final reason why I embraced it, in mathematics and biology and sciences, you can prove these things through the scientific method. In history... You can't prove history through the, through the scientific method. The, the, the strongest val validation for historical documentation is the earlier the manuscript and manuscript preservation to prove it true. There's no other book in the world. Everywhere that the Bible says a place existed and archaeologists dig it up, they find that place. Archaeology has never contradicted scripture ever. That's, that's, that's a huge statement. The oldest manuscript we possess on the face of the earth happened um, in February of 1947. Uh, a Bedouin boy, shepherd boy, um, in, in the lowest point on the earth, which is under three levels of atmosphere, 400 meters below sea level. So the UV rays don't, you can sit out in, in the Middle Eastern sun and not get burned. And as an Irishman, that, that's a good thing because we don't tan, we bubble. <laughs> And, and here in the lowest point on earth, in the arid region that's great for preservation, this, this one of, one of the, the goats goes into a cave and the, the Bedouin shepherd boy trying to get the goat out of this cliff cave throws a rock in to scare it and he hears ceramic breaking. When he goes in there, he finds these scrolls and, and all of a sudden in February of 1947, these are the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest existing manuscripts that are 98.76% accurate to the, to the Septuagint that you hold today. So for works of antiquity, nothing, nothing comes remotely closer than, than the Bible.
the, the works of antiquity proving it through cross-referencing and, and historical preservation and, and archaeological evidence unmatched. And this is the fascinating point. In this Old Testament and in, in the manuscripts that this Bedouin shepherd boy found, it's the title deed of the land. And so what happens? In November of 1947, the United Nations unanimously creates the, the nation of Israel. And then on May 14th of uh, 1948, it becomes a nation. They got the title deed. It's preserved there. It's, it's fascinating. But what's amazing about it is we're now in a battle yes. for the destruction of that land because of the anti-Semitism that's raging. Now, I'm not saying Israel's perfect, but, but let's say they, their sovereign borders were invaded and, and when we look at that and we see what they're doing in their own land and we're seeing the Semitic, anti-Semitic attacks, this is, this is what's interesting. In the 1040 window, longitude and latitude where 90% of the Muslim world exists, this is the only democratic realm remaining. Lebanon's struggling. Turkey is beyond that. There's not much remaining as far as anything democratic in that region. And they've been attacked by every one of their neighbors. They, they have been renounced and, and they're... they're they're despised. But what they possess in those Dead Sea Scrolls is the moral law, the wise restraints that make men free. The number one book quoted by our founders was the Bible. The number one book of the Bible quoted by our founders was Deuteronomy. They understood that from the moral law comes civil law. So if you're governed by those 10 commandments, one God, uh, no idols, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain, honor the Sabbath day, honor your mother and father, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't bear false witness, uh, don't steal, and don't covet. Those, those are, those are the, the, the moral commandments. And if through that filter you make civil law, that civil law will be the wise restraints to make men free. You remove the moral law and the civil law becomes a weapon to enslave. So history to me is so critical because it's a, con, it, 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 it's a continual struggle for the freedom of man. And, and we want to re-embrace socialism. We keep saying Marxism's never been tried. It's it, 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 the pure sense of it. Everywhere it's been tried, it ends up in atrocities. That's right. Conservatively speaking, 60 million dead. Liberally speaking, over a billion dead. And they go, well, this is Democrat socialism. Socialism is a turd. Democrat socialism is sprinkles that you put on a turd. It's the same thing. And yet every, in the 6,000 years of recorded history, every government's been an oligarchy. But this, the, the oldest nation on the face of the earth under one article of incorporation, the United States of America, it, it, it's a bottom-up form of government that declares you and I are the sovereign in the first three words of the, of the preamble, the constitution, we, the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union. Never before in the history of the world was it a bottom up. That would be a representative form of government. And, and, and they, th this is the last part I'll share with you. They make you and me the sovereign. And, and then they realize that man is innately sinful. So there needs to be a checks and balance system. So they create executive legislative and judicial branches, which is fascinating. Cause if you look at, Isaiah 44, 22, it says, the Lord is my God, my judge and uh, uh, lawgiver, judge and king. That's the executive, legislative, judicial branch. They, they establish this. And then they say that the, the sovereign, the people are only allowed to elect the lower house because they, they created a bicameral legislature because the larger states wanted more representation because they had more population, smaller ones wanted the same. And so they, they fought back and forth. They finally came up with a bicameral legislature. And the lower house would be the direct election by the people. They would elect their representatives. The representatives would then appoint the senators from their state. And then the electoral college, which is a representation of, of the representatives we elected, would, have, would elect the president. And then the president would appoint the judiciary. So the only ones that the sovereign, we the people, would elect was the lower house. And they gave them the most power, the lower house the most power, because they, they put them in charge of the purse strings. Mm -hmm. They had the money. And then here's what they did. They create the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment and the first 16 words of the First Amendment 
unlike our Declaration of Independence, which says when in the course of human events it becomes necessary, and it says, goes on to be so eloquent, it says we hold these truths to be self-evident. It's a Jeffersonian way of saying any idiot can understand this. Mm-hmm. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and down by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among those being life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. For this purpose, governments were instituted among men for the preservation of that. It, it's powerful. And what they're saying is there is something greater than government, and that's God. That's God. And it's eloquent and beautiful. And even the preamble of the Constitution, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, do ordain and establish. But then when it gets to the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights, it's prohibitive and angry. And it's directed at Congress. And it says, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and freedom of the press. Words must flow freely. We must debate. We must dialogue. We must come to an understanding and pursue truth. That's the power of history. And the only way for oligarchies to survive is they need to censor. They must censor the truth. The truth is never afraid of a lie, but a lie can't survive in the presence of truth. So they censor the truth in order to put forward their propaganda. And you know what? In the absence of courage, Hmm. truth is an orphan. Yeah. Long answer to a very short question. No, 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 no. Rob McCoy is my guest. There were about seven different avenues to pursue that popped up in in your eloquent diatribe. I was thinking more will. pedantic. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, the one I want to go to is probably the easiest, but the largest road. There are people watching this, and and I hope and pray there are many people watching this that aren't followers of Christ. They're not Christian. They know me from my rock and roll days. What's Frank doing now? Yeah. Here, his guy's, this guy's a pastor. He didn't talk like a pastor. You know, we've got so many stereotypes of what it means to be a Christian, the non-believing world, all that stuff. But, but here's the obvious question. So going back a bit, you talked about college, when you started studying history, you started reading the Bible. Uh, and it read you. Uh, is there a is there a level of maybe a way in which we can go to how how did you become a Christian? Hmm. What happened? I mean, did you all of a sudden wake up one day you had an epiphany? I want to be a I want to be a minister. I want to be a pastor. I want to preach the word of God. I mean, what happened? Well, I with everything, it's a process. Uh, and it's by degrees. So, you know, the first time I was ever introduced to a quote-unquote Bible study was by an English teacher in my high school. His name was Robin Adair. And and I went to the Bible study to meet girls. And and, and it was kind of cool as I was reading. I thought, gosh, this kind of has some neat wisdom to it. And and I remember someone introduced me to the book of Proverbs. And it's it, it it's a book to bring wisdom. And there's 31 chapters of Proverbs. And the person said to me, read a chapter a day. It'll bring you wisdom. And as I started to read it, some of them were confusing, but the lion's share of them were brilliant. And it was almost like sitting with an elderly man who's telling you some cool stuff in life. Yes, yes. And I couldn't get enough of it. It was just jumping off the pages into my mind and heart. I don't know that I was a believer at that point, but I was sympathetic to the scriptures. I, I found them to be unlike anything I'd read. And it, and, and it captured me. I couldn't get enough of it. And then uh, I remember praying with a... Um, a coach, uh, Bill Stees, and, and he, he, he had taken over after Mike had gone up to Walnut Creek to coach the Aqua Bears, and, and he took over Cornell Navy Swim Association, and, and we had finished the junior national, senior national, I can't remember, but he prayed with me to receive Christ. I remember that. Now, he was an interesting cat because he wasn't a real moral man, and you could see he was struggling in life, and he was just trying to get his life right again. And, but, but I was grateful for at least the introduction but when I got to Fresno State and I was sympathetic to the things of the Lord, a little bit more mindful, my roommate, John Overstreet, who is a minister, he's also a police officer uh, in Fresno, um, we decided that we were going to pursue the Lord over the summer break and come back. And uh, I didn't pursue the Lord. I'd lifeguarded and got in some trouble. And, and when we came back, I noticed he had grown leaps and bounds. I said, how'd you do that? And he said, well, a guy discipled me. I go, what's disciple? He says, they, they walk you through the basic tenets of the Christian faith, and it was a navigator study. And I said, I want to do that. And he, so he had me join him, and it was a guy named Steve Carl. Um, 
and 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 Steve equipped me. Uh, was a, he was a cotton farmer, and he ran a college group at a church in Madeira, and he was just a great guy. His daughter, interestingly enough, Megan Basham, um, was uh, works for Daily Wire, and she's the one that broke the story on you know ministers for hire or clergy for hire, where these folks are paid off by the Soros foundations and to hold the narrative and 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 so Christianity to me intertwined with my civic responsibility. It, it made so much sense to me. And then, you know, as I started to study history, I started to realize this has profound impl- implications. And, and reading about guys like William Wilberforce, yes. who ended slavery in the British Empire, you know, and, and Churchill even, you, you know, it, um, it, it, his greatest influence when he died, there was only one picture by his bedside. It was Mrs. Everett. She, he called her womb. Um, Churchill's dad, Randolph Churchill, considered uh, Winston to be retarded. And he, he wouldn't even visit him when he was at Harrow. And he wouldn't even go to see him when he was, you know, just across the street doing parliamentary business. And his mother, as we know, she was a brazen hussy, slept around. And, and even in Victorian England, um, th- they didn't spend a lot of time with their children, but the Churchills were notorious for spending no time with their children. And so Churchill and his brother uh, basically grew up under the care of Mrs. Everett who was a Spurgeon born again believer and took Churchill to Sunday school where he was unbelievably gifted at the memorization of scripture. And so, you know, he's ushered to the back bench of parliament um, and everyone's embracing Chamberlain and he's uh, seeking peace in our day. But Churchill in 1933 said, Hitler's going to turn that into a killing machine and we are ill-equipped to defend this island nation from that rising nemesis. And they laughed at him. And of course, in 1940, when it all hell breaks loose and, and the Sudetenland and Poland is invaded by Hitler, Chamberlain, riddled with cancer, steps down. Churchill takes over. And the nation was ill-equipped for war, but he led the nation with one powerful thing, and that's called words. No one understood the English language better than Winston Churchill. Mm. And the speeches he gave inspired an entire nation to stand firm and turn the tide of the war. Um, it... it, it the amazing thing is this logos, this power of words, intellectual ability to communicate truth. I, I, I find it easy to have faith when I realize and I look out at the night sky or even a sunrise, it's beautiful and it screams of a designer. You say, well, I, I, I've never seen God. I don't believe he exists. Well, I've never, I've never seen the designer or the builder of this building, but I know he exists because it, it, it screams of a designer and of order. And that's what the universe does. There's four seasons. The sun rises and sets. It, we're, we're spinning around in hundreds of thousands of miles an hour, yet we're gra- placed by gravity. And, and we look at all these things, even the intricacy of a molecule, all of this screams of, it, and he's, he's, he's a rational God that, that can be understood as you pursue science. The last thing I'll share is this, because I, I, I can talk forever. It's the Irish in me and the Scottish. Uh, The last part is this. God said, let us make man in our own image. And you think, well, God's singular. Why did he use a plural term, let us? The the word is Elohim to describe God, Elohim, which is singular plurality or unified diversity. So it's where you get the word university. Diverse realms of study to pursue a unified understanding of God's creation, sociology, anthropology, all these ologies are diverse in their aspects of study, but they all point to one thing, a designer and a creator. It takes more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a believer and a creator. That's right. Our founders understood it. And you know what? I've never seen rescue missions established by atheists or hospitals in inner cities established by atheists. They come in later to take over the work that has been done by those who sacrificially have given, and then they turn it into, you know, a money-making machine and then cancerize it and leave it destitute and broke. But uh, listen, uh, only a carpenter can build a door. Uh, a, A donkey can't build a door. You can only knock it down. Rob McCoy is my guest. I'm going to share a story and then ask a question. So years ago, when I went through one of my incarnations of becoming a new age guru and 
bought all of that stuff and was in the public eye and lectures and radio and no experience in radio. I remember the first time I did a lecture. And the night before, I just, I, I thought I had a relationship with God. You know, I'm spiritual, but not religious, all that stuff. And as I'm preparing, I realized how terrified I was mm. public speaking. So I had the brilliant idea. I'll bring books. If I get stuck, I'll just start reading from some of the powerful books I have. Mm. So I rent an auditorium in the Griffith Park area. It's still there. And 13 people show up. I had done the radio program for a short period of time then, and I'm just kind of up there bloviating and just winging it. And there's a woman in the front row, and she's shaking her head, looking at me and shaking her head. Very distracting. And finally, I stopped. I go, are you okay? She said, no. She said, you're, you're not what I thought you'd look like. I look away. It's you, but I look at you. I, it's not you. And I was like, okay. And then somebody said, who are you? I said my name, 10 of the 13 people had come to hear a lecture in the library from somebody else. <laughs> so they get up, I think I did my first lecture, six or seven people, and I thought, I'll never do that again. Well, I've done a few lectures in my time. So it leads me to this, as you were sharing. Anyone that has gone to God speak, watched you online, seen interviews with you, you've been in the media, you were the mayor of Thousand Oaks, you, you're a public figure. It's undeniable, not only through hard work, but you have a gift of oration. You have, a, you have this ability, uh, ability to speak in a way in which it just commands our attention. Not that I'm comparing, but when I was a New Ager, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I was enthralled by the way he spoke. Mm. I went to Atlanta, the King Center. I bought all of his lectures on cassette tape and listened to him. And I'm like, wow, yeah. I want to learn to talk that way. Amazingly gifted. So question, when you committed your life to the Lord in the ministry, do you remember when you first started preaching, what that was like? Hmm. You're really good at this. Oh, I don't know about that. No, seriously. I, I love the way you develop a question and then... When it, when it finally is is directed at at the one who's to answer it, I'm I'm captivated by your stories and your lead in. That I'm I'm like, oh wait, I have to answer this. <laughs> uh, that's a great question, Frank. Um, yeah, I do. Um, and and you'll maybe you'll get a kick out of it. Uh, I, like I said earlier, I was a terrible student. So other than the Bible reading voraciously, uh, classes themselves, I I didn't like to attend. Um, and I was exhausted from training and, and I do just enough to pass. And my roommate, John O, John Overstreet, he was diligent and he'd always be studying and we built a loft in our dorm. So I'd be up there sleeping and he'd be down with the light still on studying. And he, he used to comment that it would be, um, finals at the end of the semester. And he'd done all his studies and he was up getting rest to do great on the test. And I'd come in around 11 PM, he'd hear the light go on and he'd, he'd hear the sound of a new book opening and the smell of new pages <laughs> as I'm, you know, reading copious amounts, just try to grasp something to write down on the essay in this test. And then I'd finish being up all night. I'd run to go do the test, write down whatever it was I, I remembered from the chapters we were supposed to study and hoping that I'd pass. And it was the, the, the inspiration of desperation based on procrastination. And you think, that's a terrible trait. Yeah, it is. But it served me well in the ministry in this sense that I had, I had to be able to grasp principles and thoughts enough to sound relevant if I'm going to be in front of people and, and articulate it in a, in, a, in a manner that they could consume it. And, and like you, um, when I find speakers that move me, and, and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., his, his hermeneutical approach, and, and the word hermeneutics is uh, based on a mythical creature, Hermes, that would communicate between the gods and man. And really what it is, is it's just the preaching style where you use rhetoric or alliteration or synesia, um, and, and it causes people to, to take that thought you've put forward through a rhetorical uh, uh, method and it ruminates in your mind and, and, and it stays there. It's like living in your head rent-free. Mm -hmm. And, and so 
I started to realize that 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 this this was a gift God gave me to be able to memorize things and especially historical things. And and I I I started to understand that when you're speaking to people and you're telling a story that that places us all in a common realm to remind them who they are as Americans or remind them that we all struggle with these areas and you just tell personal stories. Stories are are profound. That's where you get the the parable process. And and people relate to you. And and never try to be something you're not and never be ashamed of who you were. Because my past belongs to the Lord, I can revisit it. But don't glorify your past as though you miss it. That's right. Hold it in a realm where they can see it and say, this is what I learned through it. And the candid honesty, it, 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 it's, it's helpful in the sense that it always re- maintains your, your humility because the only good thing in Rob McCoy is Jesus. I take credit for all the failure. Um, and and th- people relate to that. But, but if you're trying to appear to be pious and morally superior, people don't relate to that. And, and I don't want to live in that realm where, you know, I, I have to put a facade up, but, but my life in secret is the antithesis of what you're seeing in public. The public and the private life have to match. And, and they get all the dirt on that. So they have a lot of fun on Sundays here. Mm. <laughs> and and that, that, that's what I dig about you, Frank. You, you, you're not ashamed of your past. You, you, you also don't glorify it. But you revisit it for for illustrations that are critical for people's lives. The, the last story is this. You, you see two – you get to a, a field that says danger landmines. And you got to cross a field. And across the field, you see two guys in, in the safety zone where you need to be. And one guy's immaculately dressed, and he, he doesn't have a scratch on him. The other guy's missing an arm, and he looks like he's been exploded. And and you say to the, the guy who got blown up, how would you get across? He says, I just walked through. I hit a couple, but I made it. And he asked the other guy who's immaculately dressed, he goes, how'd you get over? And he goes, well, I waited for him to walk through, and then I just stepped everywhere that he stepped after. Wow. And, and that's, that's what you and I provide for the ones coming behind us. Hey, don't step here, or go ahead and step here, because it's, it's okay, it's safe now. Rob McCoy is my guest. I'm reading the memoirs of Charles Finney, and one of the many things that he went through and he talked about really hit me hard. And I, I pray I get this right. He said, great sermons point people to the pastor. Good preaching point people to the Savior. Mm. And I thought, let me chomp on that a while. Because we do live in a day and age, a lot of high-profile mega church pastors. I have no issue with mega church, but they seem like they've got it down. And yet it's about them And I love what you just said in the area of transparency. I yearn to hear a pastor that shared not, I don't need to hear all of his stuff, but just some kind of um, um, willingness to be humble and say, I I don't walk on water up here. Because I don't think people relate to perfect pastors that have it all down. And what the area that really rocked me with Finney, because he was part of the, the first great one, the dude went out in the woods and got hit by the Holy Spirit. He came back and none of the pastors liked him because he started speaking in a way that not only people resonated to, but it really convicted people versus maybe the perfect way of having a really nice sermon where you're up there, buttoned down, you got it all together and people are trying to go, okay, so where am I going here? I'll go here. Not that long ago, when I was somewhat in the forefront of Christian radio, I heard this buzz constantly. We're in the beginning of a great revival. Mm. It's coming. This is before COVID and the lockdowns. And I I was always kind of suspicious of that because I studied some of history and how the real big ones started. And I thought, I don't know if that's a ruse or if that's a false belief or maybe that's part of the truth. So I want to go back to before the lockdowns and i don't want to go too long here and i'm going to formulate a question but when i was in the middle of christian radio dealing with my sanctification and being new in christ and trying to navigate all these things and it was um it was a fast track if you will yeah and the one thing that was glaring to me 
two things. I'm not equipped. I've got to give it to the Lord every day. Follow him. This is not about me. Amen. Number two, I'll, I'll say it this way. We hear this expression now, COVID changed everything. I'm a little suspicious of that quote. What does that mean? So let's go back to maybe 19, uh, 2019, end of 2019, beginning of 2020, where all of a sudden we started hearing this stuff. And we started hearing these proclamations. What was it? 14 days to flatten the curve or whatever the nonsense they were throwing at us. This is my podcast. I could, I'll be careful not to drop a vulgarity here, but I kind of saw the writing on the wall and I'm thinking if I can see it, where are the people that have been in the trenches forever? So you, Pastor McCoy, um, kind of got popular by your stance and I praise God for you and your stance, but I want to share with some of the listeners that maybe don't know what happened at God Speak and what you did and maybe bring it up to, to current times where we reflect now four years later that we better wake up here. Mm. So when you first started hearing about COVID and lockdowns, if you could maybe share a little bit about nights praying, what am I doing here? What do I do as the senior pastor of God Speak? Yeah. A lot to unpack there. Yeah, for sure. I'm going to go back to Finney and then I'll come up to where you are. Absolutely. I love what you said about Finney. And we, we also can talk to guys like Spurgeon. But Spurgeon said, and, there, and there's two heroes of mine, and Spurgeon invoked one of them. His name was Robert Chapman. Spurgeon said, he was the saintliest man I ever knew. Nobody knows who Robert Chapman is. I, I mean, I've hard to find biographies on him. There's no autobiography but there are biographies and it, it required an enormous amount of work to come up with because he, he wasn't a prolific writer like George Mueller at Bristol, but it, it, it was, it was that man that inspired Spurgeon and others. And he, he, he was quiet and unassuming, but his lifestyle gave them an understanding of what it meant to be a Christian in a fallen world when they're getting celebrity status and this man, Robert Chapman, doesn't mind being invisible. And I always tell people I have the gift of preaching a church down to a manageable size. And I say that because I've always been political and people come and go, oh, we like the worship. And yeah, he's, he's a good speaker, but he's too political. And for a while I was thinking, well, maybe I should change. No, that's how I'm wired. And, and God takes the absolute of his word and the, the variable of man's personality to make a message unique unto itself. And some people are drawn to it, others aren't. And I, I knew what my lane was and I stayed in it. And, and then uh, I ran for office. I became city councilman and then I became mayor pro tem and then I was mayor. And November 7th, 2018 is when we had that shooting, the borderline shooting yes. in our city in Thousand Oaks. And I was mayor pro tem and 12 of our young people were killed. Uh, two of them were from our congregation at the time. And I was with all the families when they were told their children were one of the victims. We went through the entire night and went before the news and did interviews. And, and then the city was surrounded by fires, the Silver Springs fires, it's absolutely right. surrounded. It was, it was surreal. It was like the, a day from hell. It was, it was the most seminal event in, in our city since its incorporation in 1964. And then eight days later, I became mayor. And, you know, it was an intense time. So we go into COVID and, um, you know, the church, I don't know, three, 350, 400 people on a Sunday. And we go into COVID and they're telling us that we have to shut down. And I, I knew something was wrong. I'm not, I'm not a doctor. I don't know the severity of the virus. Um, but I knew something significant that if Costco can be open and liquor stores can be open, and cannabis distributors can be open and strip clubs can be open and abortion clinics can be open because all of those by the governor are considered essential, but the church isn't. Uh, take all of those and they don't fall under the first 16 words of the first amendment. And, and you know, governor, you have a lot of authority, mm -hmm. but you don't have the power to say the church is non-essential. 
I, I didn't need to know anything else. We were going to follow CDC standards and we were going to do communion. And he did it during Holy Week, Palm Sunday, Easter Sunday. I was done with it. And then we, we did, we, we did know the severity of the virus and I have never seen censorship like we saw during that time. And, and it just became evident and, the, and everyone is, is operating in fear. That's right. And, and this is what's interesting. COVID, COVID didn't divide. COVID highlighted where the church was. There, there's, there's this idea that, brother, I just preached the gospel. What kind of gospel compromises the truth because you're afraid of the consequences of telling the truth? That's dangerous. That's a dangerous gospel that you would hide portions of truth because you don't want to be offensive. And, and that, that's duplicitous. So we go back again to 1933. You got Adolf Hitler rising to the chancellery in Germany. Less than 9% of the population of Germany was Nazi. And, and this Democrat socialism rises uh, in, in, in Germany in 1933. And in 1933, there were 17,000 evangelical ministers in Germany, of which 3,000 approximately realized that Hitler was taking the land, Germany, that was the epicenter of the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther, I mean, this is the epicenter of the Protestant Reformation. And, and 3,000 of these ministers realize that Hitler is going to turn this, this German nation that's the hotbed of Christianity into a killing machine, and they stand in opposition to him. The other 3,000, polar opposite, embrace him lock, stock, and barrel for nationalism. And the 11,000 in the middle just want it to go away, and I just want to preach the gospel, bro. Mm -hmm. And nobody in 1933 would have ever envisioned the nation of Germany being responsible for the, for the gassing and incineration of six and a half million Jews and the death of close to 50 million people. It was the 11,000 in the middle who just wanted to go away. That's right. And, and, and that's where Hitler said to, to the, the church in Germany, he said, I'm going to take care of your pensions and your buildings. And it was, it was Dietrich Bonhoeffer who stood up and said, I'm not concerned about my pension or the building. I'm concerned about the soul of Germany. And Hitler said, leave the soul of Germany to me. And all 11,000 didn't say anything. And the last directive of Hitler before he shot Eva Braun and then shot himself in the bunker in Berlin was he made sure that Dietrich Bonhoeffer was hung. That man stood in defiance. And, and here's the kicker. It wasn't Hitler and his victims. It was Hitler and a complicit nation that agreed to lie to each other. They lied to their family members. They lied to each other. They lied to their enemies because they were too afraid of the consequences of telling the truth. Pastors in America that are too afraid to stand upon truth. Hey, there's two genders. Is that offensive? Because it's true. You get an island with 100 biological males of which... 50 have gone through transitioning surgery and put them on that island. And then you take 10 people, five of them male and five of them biological female, and put them on the same island, a separate island. Come back in 100 years on the island with the 100 males, but, but 50 have transitioned, there's going to be a pile of bones. Mm -hmm. On the other island, there'll be a population. A biological male can never, ever, 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 ever give birth. We're lying to our children who are in dysphoria. And, and in 20 years, they're going to be adults. And their mutilated bodies, they're going to look at us and say, where were you? Why didn't you say something? Name one other, besides Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Martin Niemöller, name one other minister in Nazi Germany whose name stands out, who stood in defiance of that killing machine and, the, and that, that institution of lying. None, because they were afraid of the consequences of truth. My gift of preaching a church down to a manageable size doesn't mean that I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking the truth in love. I, I'm speaking the truth in love, 
but but love isn't affirming your dysphoria. That's right. And 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 it's going to come at a consequence. And that's where we were fined three thousand dollars a day every time the doors of the church were open. They threatened me and a thousand congregants or visitors. And every Sunday, I thought I was going to be arrested. Who does that? When did that happen in this country? For a virus that had a 99% survival rate. And for our children whose schools were shuttered, they had a 0.0002% chance of death. And we shuttered their schools. The elderly died alone. The abused were quarantined with their abusers. 65% of the small businesses in Ventura County were decimated. And, and, And I asked the pastors out there, when Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, love your neighbors yourself on these two commandments, hang all the law of the prophets. Where were you for your neighbors who were losing their businesses? Where were you for your neighbors whose kids lost their schools? Where were you for your neighbors who were abused and quarantined with their abusers? Where were you when the elderly had to die alone in a hospital without their loved ones around them? Where were you? You were too afraid of the consequences of truth, and you didn't stand for them. And, and those were the ones that didn't hide Jews in Germany. Those were, that's the tragedy. And the beautiful thing about right now, when you're wondering about the, the, the situation of our country, Churchill said the man was cursed to have been born in uninteresting times. That's not true for us, Frank. Mm. We, are, we are uniquely assigned to one of the most profound and important seasons in American history that this nation conceived in liberty and dedicated the proposition that all men are created equal will not perish from the face of the earth, but there will be a new birth of freedom. And and it's it's going to be from the men and women who are uh, unashamed of truth and and unafraid of the consequences for standing for truth. That's the difference between morality and character. Morality is not doing what's wrong. Don't drink, smoke, chew, hang around with those who do. Character is doing what's right. So if your child comes home from school, says, mommy, daddy, all the kids in the school called Susie fat, but I didn't. You say, well, that was a moral thing to do, child, but where's your character? They say, what do you mean? Why didn't you tell the other children to stop it? That's right. That's character. And, and that's what's needed right now in America. And, it, and I'm, I'm watching it come from the younger generation. Yes. It's, it's fascinating. And I'm thrilled by it. I want to pick up on that point. Rob McCoy is my guest, but I want to share a story for those that may not know. And maybe it's just um, because I was so struck by it. So we were not attending God Speak at the time. I believe it was Easter Sunday. You did communion at the Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, when all of this started. And I was watching from afar, I believe online. And the thing I was struck by actually, I'm sorry, it was Good Friday. What I was struck by was Mm -hmm. your adherence to the quote unquote rules to the T where everybody was social distanced. People would come in one at a time, get communion. If I remember right, I think my memory serves me. The chair would be sanitized. We we knew that we would be scrutinized, but we were going to do it. and, And we wanted them to come after us. Because they would be without excuse, because we followed CDC standards. To the T. But you're not going to tell us we're non-essential. You want to arrest us, that's fine. But we're not going to be arrested for violating CDC standards, even though I could give a flying flip about it. Yes. We, we wanted you to arrest us for exercising our freedom of religion. That's right. And, and you know, communion takes normally 20 minutes. It took f- almost four hours. Yes. And we had people from all over coming. And it was, it was one of the most profound communions I've ever been a part of. Yeah. Hey, and guess what? Nobody died. Shocking. Shocking. <laughs> so on Good Friday, when you did the communion, what was the response from the community? Were, I, I know that the entities of the government were really upset that you had the audacity to stay open and do that, almost like you were sticking in their face when all you were doing was serving communion and honoring the CDC guidelines. What was the response from the community and the church? Well, um, at the time, prior to uh, Good Friday service, the communion, um, no, you know what? It was Palm Sunday. I'm sorry, Frank. It's, it's been 2018. It's been a while. It's been a while. And, and those are things I try to forget. But um, it was Saturday night, and I was a sitting city councilman, and I was coming up for re-election. And I was going to win overwhelmingly. And... Uh, 
I, I called the city manager and I said, uh, I'm resigning. He goes, why? I go, cause I'm going to be defying the governor's orders tomorrow. And I know that the council is going to want to censure me and you guys got enough on your plate. And you don't need that hassle. And we had a great relationship and I'd had a great term. I was, I, I mean, I'd serve the city well. And so that makes the paper and all the other stuff. And, and they know I'm serious. And I know the, the sheriff, I, I know the supervisors and I, I make that stand and it came at a cost and I wasn't messing around. And, and they, they knew I was serious. I'd given up a seat I had worked hard to get elected for that I would win overwhelmingly for another four years. And, and I enjoyed what I was doing there. And I did a good job. And they knew how serious I was. And so that was it. Let, let's do this. You cannot call the church non-essential. The church is the bride of Christ. I mean, hello, pastors, the bride of Christ. I've been married to Michelle 34 years now. I say this often, doesn't get a big laugh, but to me, I, I'm serious about it. You want to tell me my wife's non-essential? You'll be picking up your teeth with your broken arm. I mean, I, 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 I defend that she's my bride. I'm a provider and a protector. And, and, and that's as shepherds, as under shepherds, that that's our responsibility. We're entrusted with, with all these people. Yeah, amen. And, and is the truth not worth standing upon? They say, well, you, again, you're a super spreader. We knew the effects of the virus. We knew it. And so did they. And, and the longer it went, everything we, st- we said and stood upon all proved true. And, and the other thing is, I knew how the, the county government worked. I knew how the city government worked. I knew this was a gimmick. And they knew I knew. So, you know, I, I don't have a social media presence to speak of. I have a little bit now, but I didn't back then. I mean, we had 21 subscribers on our YouTube channel. I just, I just don't do social media. I don't, I don't care. It's irrelevant to me. I, I want to be with the people. When I'm with you, I'm with you. And, and any social media I have, I just got to tell the people out there, I'm not the one running it. There's, there's folks taking clips of things I'm saying and putting them up. And I'd love to respond to your DMs and everything else, but I, I just not there. I have a little thing called life, a life that I, you know, <laughs> family, and I, that's what I do. Yeah. And, um, and when we started this YouTube channel during the lockdowns, it was me and my son-in-law and, and we, we just wanted to videotape during the week, every day, giving information for our elderly who they were scaring to death. And, and the censorship was unprecedented. And, and the, the, the legacy media was every, they were just repeating each other. They're parroting everything. And so we went online, we had doctors, we had psychologists, we had financial planners. We were talking about the markets. We were talking about the, what is a virus? What is a COVID virus? We, we, every night for almost 300 episodes, every single night we were on the air for one hour, maybe longer live. And, and we just wanted to reach the elderly to, to, to give them comfort because they were scaring them to death. So it was me and my son-in-law. And as you know, Micah's half black and, and I'm white. And so, you know, the contrast, and we were sitting on a love seat and we had a grainy camera. It looked like an ISIS beheading video. <laughs> and, and, and here we are, we're just, we're, we're talking and it, it's, it starts, it, the iterations of the program begin to grow and yes. people are tuning in and the subscribers were going through the roof and we were getting millions of views on some of these things because it wasn't the quality of the broadcast as much as it was the content that people were so starving for. And, and. You know, I had guys that were CIA ground operators that gave us the intel. We had the Diamond Princess. We had all the data on that. We knew how the virus was operating. We were sharing all that with them. And it was just bringing people peace. And we talked about ivermectin. And all of a sudden, YouTube comes in and, and, and cancels us. And, and I've been banned from YouTube for life. I mean, that's a great moniker. But the governor's saying that the church can only broadcast over the airwaves. Well, watching church online is like watching a fireplace. You can hear it and see it, but you can't feel the warmth. That's right. And the Bible says, do not forsake fellowshipping with the saints. That's a, that's a command. And so the churches that locked down, and look, I get it. They, they, they probably didn't have the data I had. Um, and, and, you know, pastors think that peace is the absence of conflict. Peace isn't the absence of conflict. Peace is the presence of Christ in the midst of the conflict. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. And the sword is the, is the, is the spirit of truth. It's, it's the sword of scripture. It rightly, it rightly divides the thoughts and the intents of the heart. 
and and it, and you know it, it it's going to it's going to bring division. That's what the sword does. That's right. And and so, um, it got pushed back from some folks, but more importantly, the saddest part, I got pushed back from some pastors. Oh, you're compromising the gospel. People are gonna, and we go right back to the same thing. We we have to. Yeah, you know, look, brother. I I I I. It just it. It's a little harsh. It's true. Yeah, but but bro, they're not gonna hear the gospel. What gospel are you talking about? The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, you believe in your heart, confess your tongue, Jesus Lord, you will save glory. That we, we do that every Sunday. We're doing that. Yeah, but bro, and and I, I I couldn't comprehend why they weren't standing for their neighbor. And 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 then when they did know, they didn't do anything. That's right. But but to the credit, some of them realized they were wrong. It was like Martin Nemore. He was a he was a submarine captain in World War I. He was on the 3,000 of those evangelical ministers that sided with Hitler. And he realized he was wrong and came over and joined Bonhoeffer. And we watched a lot of those guys come over. And, and that's when we started TPOSA Faith with Charlie. We've got 3,100 partner churches across America. These are guys that were once woke that are now like, you know what? Uh, I'm, I'm done with the compromise and, and, and the fear of the consequences of standing for truth. Mm. They, they want to be liked. And, and that, that's, God didn't call us to be liked. <laughs> we have to stand for truth. Two thoughts at a KMG event we did in San Dimas with a dear brother named Jeff Vines. His church used to be Calvary Chapel, San Dimas. Now it's one and all. Anyway, he spoke up there about kingdoms. Mm. And he said, here's the deal. And Jeff's a straight shooter. And this is before all the lockdowns. Jeff said, here's the deal. I think it was his wife's father was a pastor. He said, he didn't suffer in terms of the world we live in now with all the social media stuff. When he preached from the pulpit, he just loved his congregation. He didn't have to worry about any fallout or how many likes he got on Instagram. He said, now we in the pulpit, here's the danger. Whose kingdom are we building? Are we building God's kingdom? Or are we focused on building our own kingdom? So, and he, then he said this. He said, we're in trouble. He said, but here's the truth. And reminded me that obviously God's word never returns void. He said, if we just stick to preaching the unmitigated gospel, winsomely and courageously, God's going to take care of business. So I say all that to say this. Um... I was watching, gosh, I wish I knew the man's name. Maybe you saw the video. I believe Tucker Carlson was interviewing somebody about the aftermath of all of this. And, and this man said, and he seemed to be ranking in some way. He said, here's where they messed up. They being the entities of alleged power. He said, they went after all the wrong people, the doctors that knew those that knew. He said, and here's where we are now. They've, without the entities, if you will, have unified all of these brilliant people in the times where they were maybe even persecuted or censored. And now we've got it on our side. And here's the challenge as we move forward in this new season, if you will, because people are fed up, as you said, People are willing now in some ways to risk it versus before where they kind of stood on the sidelines. I want to be focused here. Um, and they kind of tapped out out of fear. Hmm. Now, some that tapped out are like, did that, been there, done that. That's not the answer. I'm going forward. So this person was talking about this new season we live in, how it's a little unnerving, but it's very exciting. Because we're now seeing, like you said, everything you talked about has come to light. We're now seeing what the truth was in a moment. So here's my question, if there is a question here. I don't want to be too heady or over-spiritualize something. You know me well enough. With my ministry, we talk a lot about spiritual warfare. Yeah. And about um, be careful to, to uh, at least understand things start in the spiritual realm. And this is... um. This is a spiritual battle 
When I first started seeing the lockdowns, I saw the spirit of deception where good, well-reasoned people just kind of went belly up. What's that about? And I believe, I'm not, I don't have an MDiv, so this is my deal, that there was like this, this demonic release by which we're now living a time where we see evil doesn't even hide itself anymore. And there are good people, if you will, that somehow are blinded to it. And yet there are some that see it and are trying to speak the light. Let's talk a little bit about the times we live in now. Um, God speak is thriving. You've announced that you are going to step down in 2025, I think in the summer. Yeah, July 2025. And Mike is going to take over, who Solid. really enjoyed Easter. He was phenomenal. I love that kid. Um, I can call him kid because he's 30. Yeah, that's right. Um, what about culture now? What about the church now? What about Rob McCoy now? What about the gospel now? Anything that's there. I'm, I'm just kind of... I wake up in the morning and I'm like, man, things are just really funky right now. <laughs> what are we doing here? And then it's like, read the Bible. It's like, there it is. He, he's telling us what's happening here. Yeah. I, I'm an eternal optimist. I think it's a very, very exciting time. Um, first of all, fear of man is a snare. Mm. And one of the beautiful things about COVID is it revealed to people what they're actually afraid of? That's right. And, and I ask people this when I speak across the country. And I don't have them raise their hands. This is private. But I just, I just pose the question. And this is what I ask. How many of you took the shot because you believed in its efficacy? And how many of you took the shot because you didn't want to lose your job? Yeah, that's it. Or you wanted to visit your grandkids? Now, you know the answer, and I do too. And that's called fear of man. You're lying. You're lying and you're cowards. And if we're going to move forward and we're going we're gonna to make a stand for the generation coming behind us, we have to do it by example. All right, you made a mistake. Don't double down on it. You know, turn and embrace the Lord. Confess it and let's move on. Forget what's behind. Strive for what is ahead. Take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of you. You're more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Let's go. Now, granted, I, I know your radio audience is hearing me quote scriptures and the like, but suffice it to say to all who are listening, we all went through a season where we realized the things that we held dear were taken from us. That's right. And, and, and they lied to us, blatantly lied to us. And, and the church, when we made a stand, grew 400% in 18 months. We, we baptize now three times as many people as the attendance of the church was when we started this thing. And, and that's, these are folks that weren't churchgoers, agnostics, atheists, but we defended their businesses and, and they were watching what was happening. And they, and they, they in, in darkness, one candle in a room is the focal point and people were drawn. They wanted to see it. And, you know, uh, I'm scared too. I was scared thinking I was going to go to jail. I was scared wondering how we're going to pay the fines that they're leveling, levying on us. I was scared about the death threats. But you know what courage is? Courage isn't the absence of fear. We're all scared. Courage is operating regardless of the fear to do what's right. And, and, and what happens is p people start to get courage because, you know, it, 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 all, it, it all of a sudden emboldens people. It's kind of like the first penguin off the iceberg. They all jump in. Mm -hmm. They're just waiting for the first one to go. And the situation right now, now, and I, I this is where I get in a little bit of trouble. And Calvary chapels, as you know, are pre-trib, pre-millennial. Our eschatology, which for your listeners is the study of the end times. Um, in physics, for time to exist, there needs to be a beginning and an end. And eschatology is um, Christendom's way of defining how it ends. And, and there's different eschatologies on, on what Christians believe. Uh, and it's a, it's a tertiary theological position, which means it's not, it's not a basic tenet of the Christian faith. You can be orthodox in your beliefs and still differ on your eschatology. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that being said, 
We're pre-trib, pre-millennial at Calvary Chapel. But we are not permitted, regardless of our eschatology, we are not permitted to use our eschatology as justification for our apathy and inactivity. And, and what offends you reveals you. And so when I usually address this, uh, I'll get folks from the pre-trib, pre-millennial realm who, who will just come out of their skin. They're so frustrated. But, but my thought is, is this self-fulfilling prophecy that, that you know the end, even though the Bible says you'll know not the day, right, nor the hour? Yep. And they're, well, yeah, but you're supposed to see the signs. I see him, but he also says, occupy until I come. That's right. Make sure your lamp, lamps have fuel. Do your job. And, and, and when he comes, he's going to find you busy about his kingdom work. And a nation grows great whose citizens plant trees of the shade they'll never know. And every eschatology comes with an asset and a liability. For pre trib pre-millennial, we believe the next thing on God's day planner is the rapture. So everything about us is evangelism. That's why you have the Harvest Crusades with Greg Laurie and 10,000% growth since 1967, 68. And, and, and we're always throwing the net out. But we don't build anything lasting. There, there's no Supreme Court justices who, who graduated from Calvary Chapel Law School because we don't have law schools. Catholics have law schools and some great law schools. They build things that are lasting because they've been around for thousands of years. Um, you know, our founders weren't pre-trib, pre-millennial, and, and they had the idea that they had to usher in the second coming, not in perfection, but in invitation, that they were like basically cleaning the house and awaiting the king's arrival. And so they set up schools of higher learning that, that were designed to, to educate ministers, Harvard, Yale. They were all designed as, in a sense, seminaries, Princeton. And, and they, they set up the greatest form of government in the 6,000 years of recorded history that's responsible for, you know, 4% of the world's population is America. But we have more patents, Nobel Peace Prize winners, more symphonies, more accumulation of wealth than any other nation in the history of the world. If you, if you fly in an airplane, it was invented by an American. You enjoy air conditioning, it was invented by an American. You enjoy lights, it was invented by an American. You enjoy an elevator, it was invented by an American. <laughs> you, you enjoy the internet, it was invented by an American. Not Al Gore, but it was invented by an American. That's right. <laughs> because we have freedom. And, and, and I'll leave you with this. You look at the north, or you look at the Korean Peninsula at night. The north is completely dark. The south is lit with industry. And and in the thirty eighth parallel at 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 the ceasefire of the Korean War, where we lost thirty four thousand two hundred and twenty four U.S. soldiers who bled and died, protecting the freedom that they would establish at the thirty eighth parallel. Under that thirty eighth parallel, under that agreement, that accord. The North got all the, the farmland, the arable land. They got it all. The South got all the mountains. But the South got something the North didn't. They got freedom. They now have the ninth, maybe eighth largest gross domestic production of any nation in the world. They have one of the highest concentrations of Christians in Asia. I think second only to Malaysia or Singapore. Singapore. The North, their, their GDP is around 400. And their people are eating grass. And they're dying of starvation. I, I, I would simply state that Christianity's flourishing in South Korea because they have freedom. Second Corinthians says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Liberty is not man's idea. It's God's idea. Whether the listener who hears my voice is an atheist or an agnostic, whatever you are, or a Christian, or maybe a Buddhist or a Muslim. Beautiful thing about this country is the birth certificate that unifies us all. If I live my entire life in Japan and become a Japanese citizen, I'll never be Japanese. But in America, the minute I become an, an American citizen, I'm an American. It has nothing to do with our ethnicity or our melanin content or our nation of origin. It's when we as people subscribe to our birth certificate that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That means you can't take them away and, and, and no one can take them away and you can't give them away. They're given to you by God. And government's purpose is to protect those inalienable rights. So my responsibility as a minister 
yes, is to lead people to Christ. But secondly, I have to recognize that I'm defending my neighbors who may be agnostic or atheist. I'm defending their inalienable rights because I want to love my neighbor as myself. I want them to have safe neighborhoods. I want their kids to be raised without having to be indoctrinated and butchered and mutilated. I, 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 I want good for them. And the beautiful thing about it is that's why the church grew. Mm-hmm. And this is such an exciting time to be alive because you have families who have never stepped foot or darkened the doors of a church in their life. And they're committed to their kids and they're doing great in sports and their daughter is excelling and she's going to be a national champion and, and some podunk low level NC2A swimmer who can't compete in men's athletics decides to put on a girl's swimsuit and compete in the women's NC2A finals for the 200 butterfly or 200 yard freestyle and can't even beat the fastest woman ties to the hundredth of a second. And they give him the award yep. and they make him female athlete of the year. And parents are looking at that going, why don't they, why don't women transition into men's sports? Mm-hmm. Why are these thugs coming in and breaking faces and MMA and other things of, of these women? These are, they're cowards. And where are the adults in the room? We're saying that's enough. Well, what's happening is the church isn't speaking in regards to this and everyone's wondering who's going to lead on that. And when you lead, they'll, they will fill your churches because you have something relevant, because you actually care about your neighbor and you're not, your fear of man doesn't paralyze you from your lack of likes on your Facebook or Instagram or TikTok. Do your job, pastor. Do your job. Pastor Rob McCoy is my guest. A couple more things and we'll wrap it up. Those of us that sit in the congregation looking to the pastor for all the answers, I think some of us realize we, uh, it's on us too. It's uh, Monday through Saturday. It's like we go to church, we hear a good word, we're on fire, we love our pastors, we love our church, and then we kind of go out and do our thing. Evangelism versus discipleship. Would you speak to that for a moment? My good one. My good friend, Daryl Strawberry, who, God bless him, he's in a healing uh, season now. He had a heart attack and mm-hmm. he was out preaching the gospel wherever he was asked to preach. He's, he's always told me when he got radically saved at a Morris Cirillo revival years ago when he was with the Dodgers, he got hit with the Holy Spirit, but nobody came alongside and discipled him. So he kind of fell back into his own ways until he recommitted. Evangelism is prominent, but what about discipleship? Yeah. The Bible says, do the work of an evangelist. And the word evangel or evangelical is from the Greek word oulongelion, which means good news. Go out and tell the people the good news, that in your sinful condition, there's hope. That the God you've been estranged from wants to reconcile with you. And, you know, people say, I, I have a relationship and I don't like religion. Well, I don't buy that either, because the word religion is a Latin word that means relungari, which means to relink. That's right. You're, you're reconnecting with your creator. And I mean, you got to shelve your brain to say there isn't a designer of this magnificent earth. I mean, just the intricacies of, of a child's hand when it's born, uh, the, the, the intricacies of, of a single cell it is just as complex as the entirety of the human body. You look at the, you know, you've been fearfully and wonderfully made knitted together in your mother's womb. You look at the DNA structure, it, it looks like a knitting pattern. I mean, it's just so cool. And the deeper you go, the more exciting it is. And so you, you come into contact with your creator and you're thinking, I haven't been living by the laws of nature, nature's God. I haven't been giving you the time of day. I've been kind of setting my own standards. It's, it's left me, you know, I, 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 I thought I had freedom, but I've become a slave to that which I've in, in, you know, enjoyed and I can't say no to it. And that, that's, that's what broke me. You know, uh, I couldn't say no to things. Mm-hmm. And, and when, when the apostle Paul says, I don't count my life dear to myself that I, I mean, I thought it was so powerful. He has this ability to rise above himself. And, you know, I'm, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live as Christ who lives in me. I'm like, yeah, come on. I didn't want to come and improve my life. I wanted a new one. 
Because every time I tried to fix things, I screwed it up. Every time I said, I swear to God, I'll never do it again, I did it again. I, I, was, I, was, I was a moral pagan because I was an athlete. I didn't drink, smoke, chew, hang around with those that do. I was a moral pagan. I was an immoral Christian because I came to the Lord thinking, look, look at the, hey, look what you got. You know, God's my co-pilot. Well, I came to find out he's not the co-pilot. He's flying the thing and, and he's not just my heart machine. He's my lung machine. He's, he's keeping everything going. It, it was, it, it's a whole new life. And, and the, the simplicity of the gospel of saying, you know, if you receive Jesus, everything's going to be great. No, it's, it's a life of pain. But in the pain, there'll be purpose. There'll be direction. There'll be meaning. And, and it's deep and it's abiding and there's going to be challenges, but it, it makes sense and it matters. And, you know, I, I think that's, that's coming to this, this idea of being evangelized. Your eyes are open to the good news. And that's a start. Every great journey begins with the end in mind. And how do you get to that point? Well, that's discipleship. Discipleship is fascinating because we, we think it's conversion. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you want to receive the Lord, the Bible says, if you profess me before man, I'll profess you before my Father in heaven. And, and if you want to receive Christ tonight, would you raise your hand? It'll just be between you and me and the Lord. God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. I see your hand. And listen, I, you know, you're going to need a Bible and start this journey together and, and fill this form out. And I, I get all that. That's the start. Jesus didn't say make converts. He said, make disciples. And more importantly, Frank, he didn't say just make disciples. This this is going to really be a shocker for folks out there. The Lord is a nationalist. That's right. He said, make disciples of all All, nations. All the nations. You know what nations are? Boundaries, borders, compacts, constitutions, ideologies. You and I, as individuals, will be judged when we breathe our last on this earth. The Bible says... It's appointed once for a man to die, and then judgment. We'll stand before God and give an accounting of our life. And you'll look at him and say, let me into heaven. God will say, why? Well, I was a good person. Good compared to who? Mm. Rob McCoy. And God will say, that's not hard to do. Mm. But he's not the standard. Perfection is. And you have failed. And, and, the, and the Lord says, the only way into heaven. And Jesus made this statement. So Jesus can't be... He, he made the statement. It was, it was, it was an auto, uh, autobiographical statement. He said, I am the way. Exclusive. I and no other. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Man, well, you're saying that's narrow. Well, truth is narrow. Two plus two is four. Just because it's narrow, it's true. And, and challenge it. Test it. Because he makes that statement, he can only be one of three things, a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. He's a liar because he knew he wasn't the only way, the only truth, the only life. He's, he's a lunatic because he thinks he is, but he isn't, mm-hmm. or he's Lord, and he's Lord. And that's a C.S. Lewis comment. Yep. And so you, you, you now come to him, and he says, make disciples of all nations, you and I will be judged individually on whether or not we've been covered by the blood of Christ and received him as our savior. Nations, however, according to the scriptures, will be judged corporately whether or not their people had access to truth and relationship with the living God. And those who rule in those nations who suppress the truth for a lie will be strictly judged. And, and they, can exchange, they, they can exchange the truth for a bowl of red bean soup and think they're living high on the log or excuse me, high in the hog. And, and, and here's the problem. They're going to breathe their last. Mm-hmm. I hope it was worth it. You, 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 are, you, are, you are compromising and exchanging eternity for a bobble and trinket of your temporary life. And that's all you got. And your body's rotting and wilting and wrinkling and fading. And you're about to stand before God and there are no atheists when you breathe your last. Mm. The Bible says every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. You may not believe in him now, but you will when you step into eternity. And that eternity will either be with him or apart from him. And, and people say, well, I don't believe in hell. 
All right? I just want you to know, the person who talked more about hell than anyone was Jesus, because he never wanted anyone to go there. And for us to get to hell, we have to step over his sacrificial body, the cross, and say the theme song for hell, I did it my way. I don't need you. Well, you do. You do. God wants to reconnect you, reconcile you to him. He is life. He is love. He's the embodiment of truth. In him is the fullness of all joy. Apart from him, we're devouring one another. We lie to one another. Hell is the opposite of everything that's good, and heaven is the embodiment of everything that's good. Which do you want? There's, there's, there's true, and there's a lie. There's God's way, and there's man's way. And the beautiful thing about a trying time like this season, where everyone is seeing the deception with their own eyes and evil is blatant in its presentation. It's not even subtle anymore. Mm -hmm. It's making people realize, wait a minute, this is a really serious decision. And it is folks. It is. And, and, and you're going to see ministries out there. They see you as a dollar sign. That's right. And then you're going to see some that are like, they get it. Look for those, plug yourself in Get discipled, get grounded, become someone who is no longer afraid, and stand upon truth. And generations to come will be grateful for what you've done. Amen. Pastor Rob McCoy is my guest. Last thought, question, and then anything else you want to share. A couple of years ago, someone started talking to me about a book. It's called Sonship by a guy named James Jordan. And in the book, primarily, the truth is, in Christian circles, we give a lot of emphasis on the life of Christ, which we need to. Jesus is Lord, yes. The way, the truth, and the life, all of that. Francis Chan, my first pastor, wrote a book called Forgotten God. He would say, Holy Spirit, we give a little little lip service to, but he, he's kind of the forgotten God. And then there's God the Father. And the book Sonship, in essence, not to oversimplify it, says that masculinity, manhood, I think is the greatest crisis going right now, that we don't know who we are, even in the church. And the concept in the book is God the Father loves us as his sons, mm -hmm. And the missing ingredient for so many of us, we had messed up relationships with our dad. We didn't have a dad. It's hard to comprehend. God, the father really loves me. Really? Come on. So I put forth all that to say this. Um, and, and maybe I'm too close in my own circles with my men's ministry and some of the things we're dealing with. But this idea of God, the father, Jesus' whole life was in relationship to God, the father. I think of the Garden of Gethsemane when I went to Israel. I was there, and he just the night before. If, if you would, if there's anything there, talk about the importance of understanding as followers of Christ also to develop a relationship with God the Father. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, Mark 2, uh, long before the sun would arise, Jesus would go to a solitary place and there commune with the Father. Um, I and my Father are one. Um, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Father, if there be any way that's got passed from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. Mm. He, he, he had a relationship with the Father. Now, the difficult thing for folks to comprehend is it's one God and three persons. Right. And, and I, I can't explain that. Uh, you say, well, it's like, it's like water. It, it can be ice. It can be a gas. It can be a solid. It can be a liquid. Yeah, but it's not talking to itself and answering itself. And, and the Holy Spirit, the, the, the forgotten person of the Trinity, you know, is a spirit of Christ. And, and people often refer to him as, have you received it? it it's a person. It, 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 it's not an it. He's a person. Have you received him? And he's the spirit of Christ. And, 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 and you say, well, I can't, I can't explain it. Well, just because you can't explain the Trinity doesn't mean it doesn't exist. If you could explain God, he'd only be as big as your brain and he wouldn't be worth worshiping, especially the size of my brain. He's just, he'd be tiny and worthless. So, yeah, I, I, I think this idea of God the Father, um, I have five kids and, I, and my two youngest are my boys. 
They're currently 24 and 22. And when they turned 13, uh, I took them on a walkabout. Um, it's kind of like a, a bar mitzvah, but for, for Christians. And bar mitzvah means son of the law. It's, it's, there's, there's no teenage years in the Jewish mindset. You're a boy, and then you become a man. You're a girl, and you become a woman at 13, which means you are responsible for the law. You're under the law now. You, 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 you are going to be held accountable as an adult. So on their 13th birthday, I had them come out from their mother and their sisters. I said, get in the car. And I, the first place I took them was to the cemetery mm. in front of a friend of mine who actually lived over here in Reseda. And, and uh, my best friend, he died and, and I officiated his funeral and they knew him. And I took him to this cemetery and I sat in front of this, my, my friend's gravestone. I said, you recognize him? And they go, yeah. And I said, son, every great journey begins with the end in mind. The Bible says it's appointed once for man to die. And I, I said, what do you see? What do you, what, what do you observe in the cemetery? I go, well, dad, there's nobody here. I go, like the flowers of the field were here today and gone tomorrow and remembered no more. What else do you see? Well, I see the name of the person and the year they're born and the year that they died. Ecclesiastes 7.1. A good name, son, is like a precious fragrance. Better is a day of a man's death than the day of his birth. And they say, what does that mean? I said, it's synesia. It's a rhetorical term. It means it's combining two senses of the human body, sound and smell. And sense of smell is the number one sense for memory recollection, the olfactory sense. And so Solomon, who wrote Ecclesiastes, the smartest man who ever lived, he, he took this rhetorical term and he knew that the sense of smell is the number one smell for memory recollection. So he said a good name. When you hear it, it's, it's like a precious fragrance. It draws you. But better is a day of a man's death than a day of his birth because everyone's born with a name. But you don't know if it's a, a fragrance or a stench until the end of their life and how they live. Nobody's naming their kid Adolf Hitler. Nobody names their kid Ted Bundy. Yet a lot of kids are named Jesus. Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of kids are named John and Mark and Matthew, David. These are names that matter. A good name is like a precious fragrance. De better is the day of a man's death than David's birth. I said, son, you were born and you were given a name. And today you become a man and you have to decide at the end of your life because you're beginning with the end in mind. Do you want your name to be a stench or a fragrance? Wow. And if you want it to be a fragrance, you need to front load your life because freedom is having choices. And the only way you get choices is to apply restraints towards evil in order to pursue excellence. And the more choices you have, the more freedom you possess. So the more education you have, the more choices you get to make. But you have to apply restraints to make those decisions because today you're becoming a man and a man is a provider and a protector. And they would get it. And then I'd take them to the hospital and see the newborn babies. I said, anyone can, any, any man can produce a child, but very few become fathers. And when you were born, and I start to tell them about that season in their life and what it meant to me, and, and it was scary, but it was profound. And I said, and, and I see you now as a, a young man, and I'm, I'm so proud of you. And then at the conclusion of it, I, I take them to the church, and it, I'd have all my my friends, men that, that meant something in my life. And they would be from all walks of life, blue collar, white collar, et cetera. And, and I, would, I would say to my son, good company corrupts good morals, but the converse is true, that good men strengthen your, your walk with God. And I said, I want to tell you why each of these men are my friends. And I would speak into their life and tell them why these men are my friends and talk about wonderful aspects of their character. And unscripted, they said the same thing about me while they're speaking to my son. And then... We make a vote. We say, we, we, do, we, do we welcome him as a man into the realm of manhood, which is mysterious for a lot of these kids, and they've never been welcomed in? And, and they, yes. And then we pray over him. We welcome him. And they're like, ooh. And from that point on, I kid you not, Frank, from that point on, both boys just skyrocketed in, in their accomplishments. One right now is a chief of staff at Turning Point. The other is a lieutenant in the United States Navy as a propulsion officer. I mean, they're just excelling. And, and they're both, you know, well, the other one's, he's getting married May 25th. The other one's already married. And, and they're going to have a bevy of kids. They're going to be providers, protectors, great, great kids. 
But this is the last part is my youngest, when I took him on the walkabout, I was in the middle of a campaign. His birthday is in October and the first Tuesday of November is critical for the campaign, right? So I'm swamped. I got 650 volunteers walking precincts. They got life-size cutouts of me. Everyone's wearing a McCoy shirt. The phones are, you know, at the campaign office are buzzing and everybody's got walk pads and it's crazy. And I break away from the insanity of it. And I've got a thousand appointments I got to do, but I break away for that day. And I do the walkabout at the cemetery and, the, you know, the, the birthing ward. And then, and then I, I uh, surround him with the guys speaking into his life. And then they all agree with it. And then I, give him, I gave him each a gift. My one son is now in the Navy. I gave him my father's uh, Navy sword. And then this son, um, I gave him my autograph of Ronald Reagan that I got when I was, I think, 10. Mm. It's, 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 I met him and he rubbed my head and he wrote, best wishes, Robert McCoy, Ronald Reagan. It was really cool. He, he wasn't president yet, but he'd been governor. And I gave that to him. And now we're coming back to the campaign office. He's under tow with me. We come in and I go, hey, everybody, it's my son's birthday. Go, hey, and they all cheer. And I go, for his birthday, I got him. I gave him my autograph from Ronald Reagan. And we put it down on the table. And I kid you not, Frank, I couldn't have been a better illustration for my son when I told him a good name is like a precious fragrance, better than a man's death than a his birth. The phones went silent. People put their walk pads down. They all wow. came over to see the signature of Ronald Reagan. Wow. And I turned to my son and I said, son, a dead man's signature is more exciting than a living candidate's presence. That's the power of a good name. Be a fragrant son. The world needs fathers. And you know what? For all you out there who've been gypped, we don't get to pick the parents we get in this world. Yep. And some of us got gypped but you can pick the kind of parent you're going to be. And that rests with you. And you say, well, I don't have an example. Yes, you do. Read your scriptures. Find people you admire. Spend time with them and emulate them. That's what I did. Find people who've made a difference and, and see those aspects of their life that you want to apply to your own. Be the person that your family needs. Be the person you're called to be. Quit compromising. You know, do the, do the things that need to be done to be the man you've always wanted to be. Quit making excuses and blaming others. Even, even the parents who failed, honor them. You go, how do I honor a parent who failed? Because you just say, you know, I want to thank my mom and dad who showed me what not to do in life. Mm -hmm. and, and you're going to find good things about them if you just really, I mean, Churchill never said anything bad about Randolph Churchill, never said anything about, bad, bad about his father. The one thing he did say is he, he regretted the fact he could never serve with his dad in parliament. Reagan, his dad was a drunk. That's right. And, and Reagan would have to bring him in from the snow face down as he had passed out drunk so he wouldn't freeze to death. And they had to move from house to house because he could never hold down a job. And Reagan never spoke poorly of his father. We just don't do that. Honor your mother and father. will go well with you. You live long on the earth in which God has planted you. And then if you really want to honor him, be the parent they never were if they weren't good. Mm. And that'll bless them. Rob McCoy is my guest. So I'm always perplexed by whenever I have somebody that is so eloquent and so, I mean, just this has been a, a blessing for however long you've been here. How do we put a ribbon on this and say, hey, thanks for joining us on the Frank Sontag podcast. Thanks for joining us on the Frank Sontag podcast. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> hey. I like the radio guys. When I first got into radio, I'll tell the story and maybe we'll Come on. finish. So I um, did not go to school for radio. I had a motorcycle crash in 1984, just right down the road here. Guy. Shocking, a motorcycle crash. Yeah, can you imagine that? Like <laughs> no one has had a motorcycle crash before. So when I was rehabbing, I'm like, what do I want to do? I always loved radio. I listened to a rock station, like music. Long story short, it opened up, and I walked into a radio station for the first time as an intern, and I saw an air studio and a microphone and a guy sitting in the chair, and I'm thinking, I could do that. Yeah, right, sure. 18 months later, I took over the show, began my radio career, and uh, the adage, be careful what you ask for. Mm. But someone in a mentorship role said, let me tell you how to interview people. Watch this guy, Larry King. Now, I, I mean, no disrespect to Larry King, 
but he said, he's the best. And I would watch Larry King and he had this tablet in front of him and he'd be interviewing and response and next question. And I'm like, he's not even listening to what the guest is saying. That's something that was quite rare. So I learned the hard way, if you will. But here's the point. The radio guys that talk like this and have all the right things, oh my goodness, be transparent, be honest, be yourself, share some of your mess, but have a message indeed. And when I got radically saved in 09 and everything broke loose for about a week, I thought, man, this is going to be fantastic. (laughs) 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 On on my post, because I was a new age teacher, they called me Judas, people that were non-believers. And I'm like, what an interesting reference, a biblical reference. They didn't even believe in the Bible. So the point of the story is, in my early days walking with Christ, he took everything away and then reconciled everything. And I would just say from from my end here, and then I'll ask you to close, um, I gave my life to the Lord at 54, thought I had found my way in uh, transcendental meditation and all my other stuff. When I gave my life to the Lord, Francis Chan once said, he was my first pastor, he said, Lord, today's prayer is whatever happens today, may it bring me closer to you. Mm. And people would be like, ah. He's like, no, 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 no. You're not listening. Whatever happens today. And they're like, yeah, we get it. And he goes, no, no, no. You're on a plane. Plane starts going down. Whatever happens today may bring me closer to you. And he talked about relationship. And I praise God for Francis and, and my first first days as a walking with the Lord and, and being under his mentorship at, at Cornerstone. But here we are 12, 13, 14 years later. Um, gosh. Mm. You. I've been such a blessing in my life. In so many ways, as my pastor, as my friend, as a fellow radio guy, if you will, um, I cannot thank you enough, not only for that, but for being, being a man of God, standing up and, and speaking courageously where others I know in my ministry, I have so many guys and it's almost like we got to give them permission to be a man, step up. Mm. And you've done that, Rob, for so many years. Even before I knew who you were, I heard of you, started watching God speak from afar. Now we attend. And I just, um, in this day that the Lord has made, um, I just cannot thank you enough for everything you've done for his kingdom, for coming on the podcast, for being my dear brother in the Lord. And um, and, uh, we will see um, where we go from here, but I just can't thank you enough for all of that and much more of which I, I can't even begin to articulate. Yeah. And I see the sincerity in your face and your eyes and I, 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 I'm moved by it, but in the same regard, you know, I, it's an old kindergarten statement, but I'm rubber and you're glue. What you say bounces off me and sticks to you. I feel the same way about you, Frank. And I, you know, I, the first, the minute I met you, it's like we've been friends our whole life. It's, it's been a joy ever since. And I'm glad that, that God has is, is, uh, intertwined our, our lives together, that we're doing stuff. And being on your show, of course, that's, that's a joy. I feel like we're just having a conversation with my brother, you know, just having a good time. Mm. Um, I, I'm going to conclude yep. with something that you blessed me with. And I don't even think you know it. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. KM, uh, the, the, the Kingdom's Men's Gathering, KMG, right? Mm-hmm. You had, uh, you had, you had Craig mm-hmm. Shoemaker. Do you know the story where I'm going with it? I think I do. Uh, as an immoral Christian new to it and getting discipled, um, and, and I, I get my grounding and, uh, and then I graduate from college and I, I got, I got money now and I figure, well, you know, I got Jesus, but. I'm going to kind of sow my oats that I didn't do when I was an athlete. And I get in some trouble. Um, and my parents aren't Christians. And uh, the the girl I'm involved with is pregnant. And I got to go tell my parents that my girlfriend's pregnant. We gotta, we're got we getting married. 
And I, I go to tell my parents, my parents flip out. I mean, flip out. And uh, my my dad tells my mom to calm down. And my dad looks at me, he says, son, just, just have her get an abortion. You guys probably care about each other, but you don't need a baby at this stage in your life, early 20s. I said, dad, I can't do that. It's against what I believe in. My parents weren't believers. They weren't Christians. My dad says, son, look where your beliefs have gotten you so far. Oh, boy. And I'm like, whoa. And I go, dad, look, that's... That's my fault, not God's fault. I'm not following up one mistake with another one. And I just finished the Stand to Reason with Greg Kolkel so I could defend the unborn size, level development, environment, degree of dependency. You know, he's saying it's not a baby. I, I was contending with him and he, he, couldn't, he couldn't contend back and he was getting frustrated. So he finally just says, look, let me make something real clear. You marry that woman and give birth to that child, you'll never step foot in this house again. And I look over at my mother and that's so not like my dad. And I look over at my mother, she's nodding in affirmation. And I go, are you guys serious? And, and they were, we, we couldn't be more serious. And my lips quivering, my hands shaking, my stomach's tight. And I'm, I'm scared to death. Frank, I, I, it's just that moment in life where I, I knew what I had to do. And I said, I love you guys. And I'm going to miss you. Mm. And I got up and walked out. Well, it's kind of a legalistic church. And, um, you know, the... And the pastor wanted us married before she was showing. And so I don't have a friend in the world. And I'd met a girl four years earlier in Coronado. And she'd always call me on my birthday. Um, and she had my parents' number. And they said, well, you know, you might, we, 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 don't, we don't talk to him, you know. But, but through a, a circular direction through one of my siblings, it gets to another friend. And then I get word that she tried to call me on my birthday. All right. Well, I take my fiance at the time, I, I drive up to Hume Lake above the San Joaquin Valley just to try to get my mind off everything, a Christian concert. The concert was lame. We're driving back down. And my fiance asked me to pull the car over because he wasn't feeling well. So I pull the car over. She takes off her engagement ring and places it on the dashboard. She says, I have to tell you something. I, I go, what? She said, I slept with Steve, who was a college pastor who discipled me. Mm. And, um, and he's married. He's got three kids. I'm like, <laughs> I wish you'd told me that before I went to meet with my parents. I'll, I'll, I'll raise a baby. I know it's mine, but we're not getting married. So now I don't have anything. Anybody, yeah. and, and, and I thought I was doing something right when I walked out. And I've never felt more alone, uh, more confused, and more frightened. And the voices were just intense. And part of my territory was uh, from the San Joaquin Valley, you go over the coastal range, um, you know, Gilroy, Hollister, those areas, cut into Santa Cruz and also go into uh, Pismo and San Luis Obispo and Paso Robles. That was all the central coast region. And I was coming over the, the coastal range and I knew the hairpin turn because I've driven it on my way to each of those customers. And I'm thinking, let's just take it. Let's just, let's just go off. You know, I, I'm contemplating and, and, and ruminating in my mind to just, let's just end this thing. And, and it's, I don't think I would have had the, I'd hate to use a word. I, I, I just, I, I wasn't probably going to do it just because I, I was just fighting. Yeah. But as I'm thinking about this and it's the most intense it's ever been in my life, <laughs> there, there's a Craig Shoemaker tape. <laughs> it actually wasn't even, yeah, it was a tape. It was a cassette tape and it was bootlegged. And, and this, this comedian had me laughing so hard, the tears are running down my legs. You know, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm laughing to the point where I miss the turn. And I just thought, you know, laughter is good medicine. The, the, the Lord loves a, a, you know, a, a cheerful heart. And then years later to meet him at, at your gathering was such a blessing. But what ends up happening, and I'll close with this, I didn't, I didn't end up taking my life. The... The girl who I'd met four years earlier was now at Cal Poly and she'd become a Christian and she was calling to wish me happy birthday. And I got the message from the friend of my brother and I called her and said, thanks for calling. And, and she's the only person I ever carried a picture of in my wallet because when I met her, her, her laughter was contagious. I just, she's adorable. And I hated to tell her what I was about to tell her. I just said, you know, I'm, I'm going to be the father of a baby and, you know, I, she wouldn't want anything to do with me. I'm damaged goods. I took her out to lunch because it was part of my territory and we shared and I thought she'd just run for the hills, but she became my friend. And the definition of a friend is when the whole world goes out, they come in. Mm. And that's what she was to me. She was my only friend during that ordeal. 
And we had to wait for the baby to be born before we could find out the paternity of the child because back in the early 80s, it would endanger the baby if you try to do a blood test. So the baby's born. We take the blood test and it's his. It's not mine. He doesn't believe it. His wife doesn't believe it. My ex-fiance doesn't believe it. I don't really even believe it. We take the blood test, get conclusively his. I immediately asked Michelle to come out to Fresno and I proposed to her. <laughs> Fresno, lovely romantic place. <laughs> if California needed an enema, they put the tube in Fresno. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. The people are great, but the, it's, it, it gets weird. Oh, it's I see it. foggy and yeah, yeah. yeah, smoggy. I proposed to her. She says, yes. And now I got to call my folks. And I call my mom. She's not a believer at the time. And I call her. And she's, she's, there's a French word to describe her. She's kind of a, a biatch. She answers the phone. She goes, why are you calling? And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm calling to tell you I'm getting married. She goes, I, already th- I thought you were already mar- were married. And I go, no, no. She goes, who are you marrying this time? You know, like, just, you know, just want to jump through the phone and go, stop it. And I go, well, her name is Metarese Coletti, but she goes by her middle name, Michelle. Now, no one's ever heard the name Metarese. My mother goes, I know Metarese. I go, you do? She goes, yes, I know Metarese Fowler. I go, well, that's Michelle's grandmother. She said, you're marrying Admiral Richard Fowler's granddaughter? And I got chills. And, and uh, I go, yeah, mom. She goes, did you know that, that Admiral Fowler's wife, Med Fowler, was at your baby shower before you were born? I go, no. She goes, she was best friends with your godmother, Lois Early. And Admiral Fowler and your godfather, Robert Early, were classmates in the academy in 1937. I go, I didn't know that. My mom didn't like any of my sibling spouses, but she adored Michelle. And my mom became a Christian. She had confessed to having two abortions between my sister and me. That's seven years separation while they were stationed in Japan. And they thought they couldn't have any more kids. And surprise, Rob's here. Fast forward, my mom, 2010, is dying of botched lung surgery, can- uh, uh, lung cancer surgery. I walk into her hospital room and she's got her back facing to me and she's looking out the window and she looks and sees me and then keeps looking out the window. And I realize at that moment I'm walking in as her, as, as her minister, not as her son. Now she's, she's been led to the Lord by an evangelical priest, a Catholic priest, Father Michael Murphy at Sacred Heart in Coronado. Great guy. Love that man. Still living. We both together officiated both my parents' funerals and, and they, they got discipled tremendous what God did in such a short amount of time through that wonderful man of God. So I come in and I sit in her peripheral vision and she says, Rob, have I made a mistake? She's not even looking at me. And I go, what do you mean, mom? She goes, having the surgery so late in life, because we didn't know whether or not it was going to be successful. And she still had tubes with the drainage. And I'd never heard this phrase. I don't know where it came from. I've heard it since, but I'd never heard it up to that point. I didn't even know what it meant. And these words left my mouth. I said, well, mom, it's the economy of God's grace. Wow. <laughs> and she says, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm like, I have no idea. But the book of James says, if any man lacks wisdom, he just needs to ask of God. And I said, God, what does it mean? And he, he, he put an impression on my heart and I knew what to say. I said, mom, if the surgery is successful, you'll have more time. And if it's not, you'll get to see the finish line and finish well. And she goes, that's lovely. Mm. Thank you. And now, Frank, I've been by the bedside of hundreds of people who've passed. I've never been by, my, my mother's passing was the most profound I've ever experienced. I'm, I don't throw bouquets it, and I'll show you videos. It was crazy cool. And, and when my mom's heart settles at that moment, she says, um, Rob, I have to tell you something. I go, what mom? And she confirmed this with Michelle. She told her, Michelle the same thing. She says, do you remember when I told you that Med Fowler was at your baby shower, Michelle's grandma? I go, yeah, mom. She said, I never told you the whole story. I go, okay, I got time. You don't, but I do. <laughs> and she said, when I found out I was pregnant with you, your father was on a Westpac cruise and they had to communicate through ham radio operators and everything. And he said, we're not having any more kids. We're not having any more kids. And so my mother confided with the commanding officer's wife, who was childless. And my mother assumed she was childless to further her husband's career. And that was Lois Early. Uh, Admiral Early was my father's commanding officer. And she said, Lois, you know, I, I had two abortions in Japan. Where would one obtain an abortion in San Diego in late 63? And Lois says, Louise, let me investigate that and get back to you. 
And without my mother's permission, she got together with her best friend, Med Fowler, and put on a baby shower and announced it to the entire wow. squadron. Wow. Med, my wife's grandmother, bought my crib. I got to lead Med to the Lord before she died, and Lois. And my mother came to Christ as a result of all that. Amen. And it was life transforming. And I say this to everyone out there. Look, I wanted to kill myself. I didn't think it could get better. But the day I walked out to do the right thing, God gave me my whole family back mm -hmm. and blessed me with a wife who is unlike any human being I've ever met. And I just got to tell you, God reduces you to a minimum that he can pour in his maximum. And, and there's a lot of crap he's got to get rid of. So just be patient. He's not done with you yet. But trust him. Anything given to God first will never be lost. Mm -hmm. Amen. Pastor Rob McCoy has been my guest. Do we want to give God speak a plug? Not that you need more people in that place. Uh, Godspeak.com. Godspeak.com in Newberry Park, Thousand Oaks area. Um, or you can watch online if, you know. Yeah. But it's not the same. It's not. It just throws my quick thought in my head and, and we're out here. Do you write much? Are you writing at all? I'm just about finished with my first book. That's so. Can you can you share it all? Yeah. You're gonna crack up. It's I, a children's book. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it's on memorization of the Ten Commandments. Oh my god! The, the hand motions I do with a little uh, a character named Sully the monkey. Uh, I used to tell the kids stories with Sully, and I just put it in. And a friend of mine who was um, an illustrator for Disney when, it, when Disney went woke, he's he retired and. He did all the illustrations. They're, they're tremendous. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. And then I'm also writing a book on Ecclesia, but that's taking a little bit longer. That would be a little longer. Yeah. I love you, brother. Love you too. It's been a blast. It's been good. Amen. It's been deep. More to come. Thank you for today. Thank you. And I want to thank you for listening and for watching. Um, as I say, always Fridays, we drop our podcast primarily on YouTube. And let us know what you think. Reach out to us. God bless you in this day that the Lord has made. And thank you, really thank you for watching this, the Frank Sontag Podcast.